All right, this is the last sermon on 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 11 to 511. And as a way of sort of summing it up in a couple of lines, the main point of it has been that sanctification, the doctrine of sanctification, is as much family formation, the community's sanctification, as it is an individual Christian's progress in holiness. And along with that, this family lives in a glass house, so that its corporate life, the process of corporate sanctification, is itself a witness to the world around it. Now, this corporate life witness does not replace the actual verbal witness, the, the, the kerygma, as it's called, the message of salvation, that Christ died for our sins and was raised up on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. But that's true in terms of corporate sanctification versus a believer's individual sanctification. One does not rule out the other. They live side by side in a complementary way. So, I guess we could call this a three-dimensional Christianity. So, imagine it. Imagine it in the ancient world, or maybe in another part of the world today that is largely unchurched. Uh, a missionary or a group of missionaries arrive in cities to plant churches. They may stay for a period of time. They may want to establish uh, basic discipleship, try to appoint qualified leaders for the church. But when they eventually move on, they leave behind not just a church, but an ongoing and highly visible witness in that same city. It's something of a permanent investment in the city where they evangelized. Now, this ongoing witness is not an evangelism club whose members are all chosen because they are skilled speakers and brilliant apologists for the faith. No, it's Christ's family. Better, it's Christ's body, whose individual parts function within the whole to sustain it and to edify it and actually to participate in the common growth in Christ. There is not one individual in this room this morning, not me, not anyone here, who can say, I am the body of Christ. <coughs> That's absurd. Yet practically speaking, at least in Western Christianity and how Western Christianity functions, individual disciples whose uh, personal serenity plus their testimony equals being a light, a light in wherever they are, the workplace, their school, and so forth. Meanwhile, the churches that those individuals belong to look like, well, they look like every other worldly organization where you find ego and envy, feuds and factions, impersonal and insincere, moral, political, and credulous people. That's not the way it should be. It is not on the individual, but on the community in its entirety. Now, it often occurs to me when I contemplate the larger scene, that if I weren't a Christian, I don't think I would want to become one. 
But when I think that, then I remember that to that list of church vices, I can also add smug and self-righteous because that's as individualistic a way to think as anyone else who makes that the essence of the Christian experience. And if that's me, roughly 38 years as a believer, well then what does Christianity look like to the rest? In other words, if I see Christianity that way and become discouraged, and I'm in the family, what does Christianity look like to the rest? That is, to the outsiders. And this is where I introduced the Atticus Finch rule. You never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb into his skin and walk around in it. And just as an aside, uh, I, I, was, I had a long conversation with a young woman this past week who's not a Christian and who's very much a part of the world as it is, a, just a fine, lovely young woman. And we were talking about political issues, not, not in a contentious way, but in a, in a relaxed and friendly way without too many of the details that could set off a conversation like that in the wrong direction. And I pointed out something that was fundamental to a conservative way of seeing the world, and this person did not know that. Simply, something that was essential, a core issue in conservative thinking, whatever the, whether you agree with it or not is irrelevant, the point is, she had never heard that this was conservative thinking. And it was important, and in a sense, in that regard, almost enlightening. Maybe we could say that even as I was trying to see the world in her skin, she had a moment where she saw the world in mine. And we came away together better informed. That's what I'm trying to describe here. We're very insulated, but can we ask the question, how do unbelievers look at the church? Well, to the rest, the church already has two strikes against it before, before the, the, the people even begin looking at us. We're an organized religion, and organized religion, of course, is a wretched experience by itself, but we're an organized religion where the people who hold the power, who turn out very often to be hypocrites, have control over other people's lives. What could be worse than that? And from there it goes downhill. It is a wretched and it's sometimes embarrassing history as we try to explain to the world why the Israelites were entitled and actually ordained by God to murder the entire population of cities, all the way down to the women and the children. The church is characterized in history by anti-Semitism on both the Catholic and the Protestant side. There were those crusades in, the Middle, e in the, uh, the Middle Ages to the Middle East, and all that witch burning. Not many people know that only 21 witches were ever put to death in the colonies of what became the United States, but 21 is 21 too many way, way fewer than what was going on in Europe at that time, but that was European Christianity. Christianity appears to be misogynistic, especially under Catholicism, where women, women are bound in marriage no matter what the conditions of that marriage are and are prevented from using any type of birth control, even if it means 
saving their own health or their own lives. America's Bible Belt coincides with, not entirely, but with the Old South, where racism ruled the day for well over a century. And we have an ethical hierarchy where we gauge sins according to their uh, evil. And this encourages a hatred against certain types of people while permitting all other kinds of sins that are not so serious, at least not as we see them. Now you might say, well look, the rest, don't they have a natural bias against Christianity? Well, of course they do. It's the, the seed of Cain versus the seed of Abel. But the real question is, is this judgment at all fair? Even if the people have a spiritual force at work in them that produces hatred for Christianity, is their judgment in any way fair? Well, in one way, no. It's one-sided, it's unbalanced, it overlooks perhaps all the good things that Christianity has brought to the world. But on the other hand, there is enough truth in it that, well, we should be ashamed. And almost as a, a planned weekly delivery, I open up my copy of the Christian Post. Here's the headline from yesterday. The nation, America, the nation's trust in honesty, ethics of clergy hits all-time low. This is Gallup ranking how professionals, rather how professions, are seen by outsiders. All-time low. And here's why it is all so tragic. The Christian church, the one bright light in every dark city on the face of the earth, has this precious, invaluable message for the rest that needs to be protected and preserved at all costs because no one else no other institution, people, group, nation has been entrusted with this message. And if the Christian church really believed its own message, it would protect it and preserve it and actually live in such a way as to announce it, even without words, that we have something that the rest want and need whether they know it or not. And our message is that the Lord Jesus Christ has conquered death and that He is coming again to bring His justice to the world, to save those who loved Him and waited for Him, and to destroy those who opposed Him. Now you may say, well, I, I think Christians talk about these things all the time. But really, that's my point. Christians talk and talk and talk. They talk about anything and they talk about everything. So, in all the talk, these essential, precious, invaluable messages are lost. And while Christians are doing all this talking, they frequently do the talking without the conviction. The conviction that people can see in their churches. Those local reference points where it counts the most to see churches with Paul's version, expression, of Jesus' values. And so, just two points this morning. The first is, the rest, and I'm going to keep using that phrase, the rest face death without hope. 
This is from 1 Thessalonians 4.13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do, who have no hope. And literally it says that you may not grieve as the rest who have no hope. The rest face death with no hope. When the TV show House, one of my favorites, had its original pilot, there's this great scene in it, uh, this kind of scene that caught my attention. And the story surrounds uh, this kind of sweet, doughy-eyed young woman who teaches kindergarten and loved by everybody and she collapses and there's some mysterious disease and only House, of course, is the one who will be able to solve it. And while they're going through all the tests and trials to figure out what's going on, she says at one moment when she and House are alone, I just want to die with a little dignity. To which House replies, there's no such thing. Our bodies break down, sometimes when we're 90, sometimes before we're even born. But it always happens and there's never any dignity in it. I don't care if you can walk, see, wipe your own bottom. It's always ugly, always. You can live with dignity, but you can't die with it. And that's why I loved House so much. What would happen if you had a brilliant doctor, diagnostician, who actually lived and acted as if the scientific worldview that he lived by was true? He can say, it's all a charade. We're all pretending that you can die with dignity. But the reality is there is no such thing. This is the logical outworking of a scientific, materialistic way of seeing the world. Nothing has an essential value to it, so it is only the value we assign. But we can't assign dignity to death when we see what death really is. Now, I've personally witnessed hundreds, if not thousands, of deaths. Well, in the movies and on TV. But, but in a sense, death became what I saw on film. Men go to war and they die, but there are no wounds on their bodies. They run and they shot and they go Aah! and fall down. It really wasn't until Private Ryan came along that there was any effort to show that death wasn't such a, a, a hygienic, uh, non-bloody event. And it was the same with all the westerns I watched and all the TV cop shows. People are shot or something and then they just die, but there's, their bodies are unaffected. And in the old movies, if a hero or a heroine dies, it's usually in a bed, painlessly, with just enough time for a few final words Anyone seen the old version of Wuthering Heights with Merle Oberon in bed? David Niven and Laurence Olivier. Look it up on Turner Classic Movies. There she is lying on the pillow, soft glow on her face from the camera. <coughs> and then when she dies, it's just a closing of the eyes. That was death. But in real life, for nearly all of human history, non-battlefield death, and by death I mean the actual instance of dying, 
was often terribly painful, absolutely frightening, and may be prolonged even by days, if not weeks. It's only common grace that has given us the blessing of hospice care, where so many of the, the terrible experiences associated with death can be ameliorated with various medications and so forth. But death as the instance of dying, that is when Merle Oberon just closes her eyes and her head swoons down on the pillow, that's only the beginning of a longer process of terrible indignity. Remember what God said to Adam, by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now that's a very poetic way to describe what we know as the corruption and the decomposition that the body undergoes after that terrible event of actually dying. And this to a body that God created and declared to be very good. That's why in, throughout the Bible, and I'm sure in many cultures, it is a curse on an individual to remain exposed in one way or another after death, to be, to be eaten by birds or other carrion beasts, to be exposed, to be on display in the process of decomposition. Because that body, that body is still that person even after death. That body is not the cage that the imprisoned real person finally escapes from. The indignity of the dead body is the person itself. Christians should never use the phrase, well, the real me, as a way to refer to what they would think of as their spirituality. The real you is sitting here today in this auditorium. Body and soul. That's the real you. Maybe we'd all benefit if we had a, an all-church retreat to a body farm. Have you ever seen a body farm? There are, there are about six of them now, I think, in the United States. But the first one uh, was created back in the late 80s, I think, at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And it was land set aside, and if you will, seeded with human cadavers, so that scientists could actually observe and take notes on, empirically reckon with, the decomposition process of the body. And this would have benefits in all areas, uh, forensically and medically and otherwise. And so it sounds as ghoulish as it is. Bodies are simply left out in the open, sometimes in different conditions regarding weather or exposure to heat or cold or what have you, just so we can observe what happens to the body over a period of time. So on this field trip that I have planned for the church, during the day we just stroll through the fields and we'd stop at the various sites to observe the decay process for ourselves at these different stages. And just be prepared, I'm telling you ahead of time, for the strong odors that you will experience there. Because that's death. Death isn't simply that transition from being alive to ceasing to be alive. It is this ongoing process where these beautiful bodies that God created return to the dust. And that's the death that terrifies the rest. 
The rest cannot find any comfort or any consolation in any belief system whatsoever that speaks to their terror like the Christian faith does. Certainly not in the sciences. Brace yourselves because the materialistic way of looking at the world does not necessarily account for your tender feelings about the human race and about yourself as a part of it. You must get used to the reality that this is what happens when you die and there is nothing more after that. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as the rest who have no hope. And here it is. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose, that's it. We believe that Jesus died and rose. It sounds a bit like the message of 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, to which I alluded at the start of this sermon, where Paul, who says the gospel is Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, he was buried on the third day, he was raised from the dead according to the scriptures, Paul actually leaves the died for our sins part behind and dedicates nearly the entire chapter so that he can concentrate at great length on the resurrection of the body. That's my favorite series that I've ever done here. It gets one vote. But I would encourage you, if you haven't heard it, to go and listen to that series. If I had to pick one, because that's where the essence of Christianity is to be found over and against all the rival faiths and religions and systems in the world. Christ died and rose. This is, I'm going to have to do this in the sinfulness of sin series, but if you read in Romans, the, the language Paul uses about death, death is an overlord, death is a king. He uses the word for king and lord in their verb forms. When you hear something like death reigns, death has dominion. It's as if we are all enslaved to it. And when Christ rose from the dead, Paul says, death no longer had dominion over him. So when we say we believe that Christ died and rose, we are saying more than we can ever imagine, that the lordship of death over the human race was broken by the man, Jesus Christ, and thus by extension to all who belong to him. Get a room full of people who represent the world religions, and the quasi-religions and the various generic spiritualities that are out there and ask them to tell you what happens after we die. And like a Greek chorus, they will all say in one voice, we all go to a better place. Then the one thoughtful Christian steps forward all alone and says, we wait for our body's resurrection. That's the only thing that distinguish. Well, no, that's too strong. That is what distinguishes Christianity from all the other systems. Christ died and rose. That decomposition and decay and corruption, even that, can be reversed at the resurrection. This is the message that only the church has and why it can genuinely have hope in the face of death. There's per, poor Merle Oberon. She was uh, in Wuthering Heights. Kathy in Wuthering Heights. 
She looked as beautiful on her deathbed as she did in her glamour photographs. She wasn't emaciated. She didn't have any bed sores. She wasn't in any pain. She wasn't incontinent. She certainly wasn't going to be incontinent in front of Heathcliff when he came in. And Heathcliff didn't stop at the door and go, what's that smell? It was all so beautiful and neat and poetic and fake. Because as soon as Kathy dies, she has to be buried quickly. But even decomposition, this terrible distortion of the beautiful human body, even that isn't the end of the death process. Death is only completed when Christ passes judgment on the dead. And that's my second point this morning. The rest are asleep while judgment approaches. The rest are asleep while judgment approaches. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 6, So then, let us not sleep as the rest, but let us keep awake and be sober. Let us not sleep as the rest, but let us keep awake and be so sober. There is good news about death from the scientific or materialistic worldview. It may not have dignity, and it may be an end to your existence, but at least there's no wrathful God waiting for you on the other side. And Christianity, that, that source of light in every dark city says, yes, there is. And Jesus' resurrection, that same event, is God's announcement to the whole world that Jesus himself has been appointed to judge the world, to bring his justice to the world. I often make the point that people of, of all political persuasions and nationalities have a, have an, a, a craving for this thing they call justice. I see that as something of the image of God. Well, that craving will finally be realized when Jesus Christ brings his justice to the world, but it won't match up identically to anyone else's unless they are found to be in him. Paul refers to it here in verse 3 as sudden destruction. And it's interesting, as an aside, Paul never refers to hell. He never refers to Hades when he describes the future judgment. He always uses phrases like destruction or perishing. But if you think he's letting us off the hook, listen to 2 Thessalonians 1, 4 through 10. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are also suffering. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted, as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. So whether Paul ever refers to a hell or not, this is 
packed with terrifying images, God's righteous judgment, the appearance of mighty angels, flaming fire inflicting vengeance, the punishment of eternal destruction far away from the Lord's presence. It sure sounds like hell, even if Paul doesn't use the word. And all of this, this this great cosmic upheaval, all of this as a promise, a promise of relief and a promise of vindication to a rather small group of people who meet together for worship in that city, who are given what amounts to secret information about their own future, but also the future of their neighbors, of the shopkeepers, and those who repair tents, and those who supply water to the wealthy, and everyone else who lives in that little city. So what is this secret information worth? Better, what effect should it have on that small group of people who possess it? Well, as it always is with Paul, his eschatology is practical. It's community shaping. So, verse 10, when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed, and then all those nasty people will finally get theirs and you will just stand by the side laughing and point... No. He says this, to this end, or with this in mind, that is what I just said about this appearing of Jesus Christ, we always pray for you, that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power. Why? Why do we pray for this? so that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see this insight into the future, into their own future as believers and into the future of everyone around them? This insight is productive. Seeing this is so, you are to be worthy of his calling. And you should exercise every resolve for good and every resolve for works of faith. And even this is subservient to a larger end, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him. Now, that's certainly true within the church, but why not a spillover effect? Why not a spillover effect? After all, that's where we began this kind of mashup, right? In Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. So let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Similarly, right before Paul launches into that extended passage, chapter 4 and into chapter 5 on Jesus' parousia, with all that that event represents, what does he do? He reminds Christians to work quietly with their hands. Working quietly with one's hands, or on one's keyboard, I suppose, in the modern world, is a mark of true eschatological hope. Working quietly with one's hands is a mark of true eschatological hope. Now, you might think that knowing all of this in advance about Jesus' parousia should call us to, I don't know, walk up and down the sidewalk with a 
The end is near sandwich board hanging on our shoulders. That seems more intuitive and fitting to the occasion. Paul says, nope. Nope. Paul says, since you know this great cosmic outcome, you should live modestly. Without a political agenda, you may enjoy your sexual relationships as long as they are within marriage. And you need to get a job and hold on to it. And when death strikes, let the rest see your hope, which you collectively, as a church, conscientiously keep alive in your midst with your words of encouragement and consolation, the words about the parousia that you use to build each other up. See, Paul's playing the long game. But the long game is so counterintuitive that we largely give up on it. So yeah, sure, Christians talk about death and future judgment, but they talk and talk and talk. They talk about anything and they talk about everything so that this essential message sort of disappears into a Where's Waldo book. So yeah, Waldo here is Jesus died and rose, but there are 600 other Christian messages on the page that make Waldo indistinguishable from the rest. It still amazes me if anything happens in the world, and of course when we say if anything happens in the world we really mean if anything the media has put out because the media decided a story was important. Christianity thinks it should hold a press conference. It just bugs me. I'm Christianity and I'm ready to take your questions. Christianity, Christianity, I'm Doug from Sports Illustrated. What do you think about the way the NFL is dealing with its concussion issues? Well, as the spokesman for God on everything you could possibly think of that happens in the United States, I have an opinion on that. Christianity, Christianity, who do you support in the Republican primary? What do you think of yoga? What do you think of Santa Claus? Ugh. I want if I were king, I would tell every Christian organization in the United States to shut up just for a little while so that all of those Waldo lookalikes might fade away and those two Waldos, Jesus died and rose and judgment is coming, might stand out crystal clear. And people might want to know, do you have anything to say about death? But somewhere along the way, the church traded Paul's eschatology for an eschatology that is so overly realized that it's now normal for the Christian church to think about gaining and holding territory that is, earthly real estate as part of God's mission in the world. That is, to own the land, to own the culture, to own the politics, and to own the laws. This is God's world, after all. He created it. So it's our mission in the world to actually take back the territory for His glory. I had this image in my head, and I didn't put it in the sermon, but I'm going to put it in the sermon now. That the Lord Jesus, I don't mean to be irreverent, but he asked Peter, uh, what's the church doing right now? And Peter looks down, and he sees, ah, eh, we'll make it around the time of Constantine. Uh, looks like Christianity has taken over the government, 
and they're outlawing all other religions on the pain of death. She says, wait, what? What, 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 what? No, he leans over. Don't, wait, stop, don't. Ugh. And that's the legacy we've been left with. And I'm bold enough to say that this is an entirely different value system than Paul's. And that I would even go as far as to say it's a rival religion to Paul's. And the Reformed churches are in on it. If the Reformed community were soup, it would taste sour. So we need to reach, to reach for some of that Anabaptist seasoning and sprinkle it on the soup, not to, take, not to dump the whole thing in, but some of that Anabaptist otherworldly uh, Sermon on the Mount thinking and sprinkle it in there to make the soup taste good again. Otherwise, the church is just one more worldly agenda competing with all the other worldly agendas, and nobody knows that Jesus Christ died and rose. When Paul says, since we believe that Jesus died and rose, he is saying that everything else is no longer important because sin and death are destroyed. This is to form the way we live individually and as communities, and as a community, our worldly, our wordless witness to the rest, who live in the terror of death and who are ignorant of the coming judgment. Brothers and sisters, do we believe our religion? I took that from a Presbyterian theologian who was speaking to the General Assembly on mission, but it's appropriate here too. Do we believe our religion? How would the rest be able to tell that we do? Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for that brief yet extraordinary confession of faith. Jesus died and rose. And this is all of our hope, all of our righteousness, everything that makes us Christian is bound to that confession. And we pray that its power may permeate the church so that our value systems would be readjusted, centered on the heavenly realm, and considerate of those who are perishing around us. Free us from all of our earthly concerns and agendas so that our testimony may be pure, so that we might not be ashamed on the day of our Lord's appearing, that we were good witnesses by word and deed. Father, be with us to that end, we pray, and may we find strength and consolation in the meal that Jesus left for us, where he presents to us really his death and his resurrection. This is the center of our faith, and from it we derive our life. We thank you for the bread and the wine, and we thank you that Jesus' words have separated the bread and the wine for this sacred purpose. And we pray that you would bless us as we come to the table, as we acknowledge our unity as a church, and as we return thanks to Jesus Christ our Lord in the Spirit. Amen. The focus of the Lord's Supper is traditionally the place where Jesus presents his body and his blood for us so that there may be the forgiveness of sins and a new covenant. It's that phrase about the new covenant that contains 
so much of the explanation of what the body and blood represent. Certainly the forgiveness of sins, but the new covenant represents, it represents a transformation of a people who, because of their relationship to the risen Christ, are no longer merely earth dwellers like the rest, but even now have moved into that heavenly realm where Christ is seated in glory and in honor. Paul says this explicitly more than once. So really, the supper is in its own way an arrow pointing beyond the world in all of its mortality and decay to the new world that has already begun with that resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Paul can say, set your minds on things above where Christ is seated. And when we come to the table, we are not only looking back to the night on which he was betrayed, but we are looking up to the place where he is seated now in great glory. So, as we come to the table, come to it and see it as that arrow that points to the new age that has already arrived with Christ, with all the meaning wrapped up in the resurrection of his body. Come with humility, come prepared to be reoriented in your thinking, and come with gratefulness that you are so very welcome at his table. If you are not a Christian, then please don't come to the table, for you are not a participant in Christ Jesus and in this heavenly life that he provides for his people. But to all the rest, even those who are weak and struggling and discouraged, if you can confess that Jesus is Lord, then you may come to this table and eat and drink and be satisfied.